a time of celebration. I am so honored to be back uh, for the 10th anniversary. So thank you. And to all of you, my sisters, and I claim you all as my sisters without regard to race or culture or religion or class, we are all sisters. And if you could see you from where I am standing, that is cause for celebration, right? Because we are reminded of the power of the potential that is among us, us women folk. And so I want us to think of this as a gathering of the community and to share and to hug and to encourage each other throughout the day. I am particularly blessed this morning to have two sister friends, my college classmate, Patricia Smith, and my dear friend from college's older sister, who was like our, all of our sisters, Jane Rogers. And so it's a blessing to have you all here this morning, and I thank you. My time is short, and I have a lot to say, and I don't want to get the hook. So I'm going to get on with it uh, this morning. But I want to dare us today. I want us to think about the challenge um, of, of, of just thinking about daring. You remember when we were kids and we'd say, I dare you? I double dog dare you. And if it got really intense, you know, I double, double, double dog dare you. And so the real challenge today is for us to take charge and to dare to take charge of our lives and to do what we can where we can in a way that we're living our lives such that we're putting an anchor in the ground to make a difference in a way that will live on and on and on and will benefit generations yet born. And so I'm a storyteller for those of you who've heard me speak before. And so I'm just gonna tell you two stories today if that's okay. Because you're gonna hear from amazing women today and you're gonna get so much information. But I just wanna encourage you today. That's, that's really why I'm here, to just encourage you. And so I wanna start with a story. And it's really, I'm gonna just do a little excerpt from my latest book, Dare to Take Charge. And I almost didn't include this story in the book because I would never really admitted this. But this is the story about the day, the time in my life where I almost quit, where I almost gave up on my dreams. And there may be somebody in here this morning who's at a crossroads and needs to be encouraged. But let me just share this, and I'm going to not do very much of it. I'm just going to take little excerpts from it. But the chapter is, How Dare You Not? Aunt Frances was my grandmother's sister. She didn't have children. She treated my father like he was her son. And so she was like a third grandmother to us. And she was just amazing. Aunt Frances was a pillar in our family. She was my grandmother's sister. And so all the time I knew her, she was an older woman, a wise elder. She had lived her life with dignity and finished her professional life with pride. She was someone who thrived in life and who continued to live as an example in her old age. She had seen the worst days of the segregated South. Before she retired, she lovingly labored for more than 40 years as a school teacher, making half, half, you all hear me, half the salary of her white counterparts, but I never heard her complain. At a time in my life when I felt particularly discouraged, I went to see my Aunt Frances. And her advice so changed me that that moment is emblazoned on my conscience, and my meeting with her remains a significant moment in my life story. And so I'll just paraphrase this next part. When I began law school, you know, I thought I had it all together. Actually, I went to law school because I couldn't figure out what to do with my degree in history and political science from Mount Holyoke, I thought, oh, I better go to law school, I gotta figure this out. Never really expecting to practice law, and so, you know, I thought I had it together, but I also, like a crazy woman, was working full time. I was working full time as the assistant dean for women in the undergraduate school. I mean, why didn't I work in the library, wait some tables, something, you know? I mean, this was like heavy duty, so I was, overworked, stressed out, drowning, crazy, going out of my mind, and I was hating law school. 
because I had responsibilities. You know, a student got raped. I'm in the emergency room. I had to tell a student her father had gotten killed. I mean, it was just really intense. And law school is intense. So I hated law school, hated it. <laughs> now, this is written, let me tell you. We're talking, I started in August. This is October we're talking about. You know, like, I just started. It was rough. I had just started, but I was really questioning why I had gone in the first place. I needed advice, I needed some sympathy, I needed affection, I knew where to go. So on a cool fall day, I shut my books and I drove to see my Aunt Frances. On the drive, I had time to consider my situation. Although I had never been a quitter, I was seriously thinking about quitting. I'm gonna tell you the truth, and Jane and Pat will appreciate this. This was my warm up. I was gonna go see Aunt Frances before I went home to tell my mom and daddy. That was the plan. She greeted me as she always did with warm, loving hug I was craving. Aunt Frances was generous with her life and her affection. I curled up on that old familiar sofa and she could see my heart was heavy. She asked me what was wrong. I was so stressed I didn't need much prompting. I went on and on and on and on about how absolutely miserable I was in law school. Aunt Frances just sat and listened. I moaned and whined about how terrible law school was until finally Aunt Frances stopped me and she asked me just one question. Do you want to be a lawyer? I nodded, not even able to speak out loud. Then Aunt Frances said words that changed my life forever. Baby, if it were easy, everybody and their mama would be able to do it. But it isn't easy, and you have been blessed with gifts to do what you set out to do. Aunt Frances held my glaze as tears rolled down my face. I thought Aunt Frances had seen the worst of times. She had been a survivor, and she had been victorious with a mere fraction of my opportunities. Here I am in law school. I have, I have, all of these opportunities. Before me sat one of my sheroes. Aunt Frances had struggled more than I would ever have to. How dare I complain? She done more with less. Her years of unwavering dedication and now her unwavering gaze caused me to look at the me she must see. I became very uncomfortable with myself and particularly with my whining. How dare I moan and groan about opportunities she could never have dreamed of. Aunt Frances expected me to see grace in my life, that I was able to go to law school at all. How dare I not claim my dream and my destiny? How dare I falter? How dare I not march forward with all the purpose and passion I could muster? How dare I not stand up Restore my faith and go ahead. Whoever told me that the road would be easy. And so that's the challenge, my sisters. No one ever told us that the road would be easy. But we are here at this place, at this time in the history of the universe. And how dare we not claim our destiny and our dreams. And so, I want to encourage you, even when it is hard, that we have to deep, really reach deep into our souls. And I'm going to come back there with the last story in just a moment. And it's so interesting because I have a timer, and my assistant, Naima Rashad, would love to have this timer because she, you know, she would, it would keep me on time. But I'm going to be very mindful of the time. And I'm black and Baptist. I don't know how they expect me to speak in such a short time, but, <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I promise I'm going to do it. <laughs> so homework. You didn't think you were just going to come and listen to me this morning. A challenge that I want all of us to take sometime before this weekend is over. I want you to ask yourself this question. What is it that I've always wanted to do, but I've never done it? Right? 
Get quiet wherever that quiet space is in your life. You know, turn off the phone, tell the kids you'll be back, whatever. What is it that you've always wanted to do and you've never done it? Question number one. Second question, and this is where it gets hard. Why not? Why haven't you done it? Because you don't want to look back on this part of your life and wish that you had. Have you not done it because you've been busy with other people's dreams, that you haven't given attention to your own dream, that you've not dared to do what you really dream of doing? Are you so distracted by other people's confusion that you haven't done it? Is it fear? Do you think you'll fail? Well, let me tell you one thing. There's no such thing as failure. You're just warming up for success. You got that? Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. You're just warming up to get it right. And so you've got to really stretch sometimes. And so I want you to really give that some thought because if you do some soul searching on that, and really figure out what it is. Why haven't you done it? And then the third part is, what is it going to take to get you to do it? And then another piece that is totally different but very important is that too many of us are being lost to breast cancer. And so I want you to get a bosom buddy here before you're done today. Somebody you don't know. Don't do your neighbor or your coworker or your girlfriend. Somebody you don't know, I want you to get a bosom buddy. And between now and the next Pennsylvania conference, a year from now, every first Sunday, because it's easy to remember, every first Sunday, usually we're not quite as busy on Sundays, you all talk. Three questions. Have you done your breast exam? Number two, how are you? And number three, what can I do for you, my sister? So there should be 12 conversations between now and next year. We're going to encourage some people, and hopefully we're going to save some folks' lives, and certainly we're going to make each other healthier. So can we get some bosom buddies going in here this morning? <laughs> Wonderful. All right, so lastly, I want to tell you the story quickly, um, because this is my dad's lesson to me. Daddy's girl, he passed suddenly some 20 years ago. Um, and this is a lesson, lots of lessons, but this is the lesson I want to leave you with my sisters this morning. When I was in first grade, I hated school. I guess this is sounding like a trend, right? You know, I hated law school. Maybe I shouldn't have told these two stories back to back. I hated law school, I hated first grade. I hated first grade! Because my mama was a school teacher, and so I knew how to read. My dad was an avid reader, so I already knew how to read before I went to school, right? So I'm sitting there, first grade, Miss O'Neill's first room, first grade class. C. Dick Run, C. Spot Jump, C. Jane Spot Stop. I was sick of Jane Spot and Dick. Hated it. I did. I hate it. I'm not. I'm, it was awful, and I was. I had this chair that didn't fit, and my legs couldn't touch the ground, and it was wobbly. And Miss O'Neill would say, Linda, stay still. I mean, this, this first grade stuff was not working for me. Kindergarten was cool, punch cookies. I loved all that. That was working. You know, hokey pokey, hang out with your friends half day. Because you didn't imagine I was a very social child, so that worked. This first grade sitting still with Dick and Jane and Spot was not working. So she kept saying, children, we're going to get books. We're going to get books. And we didn't get no books. So finally, she passes out books. And it was finally my time to read out loud. You know, we're going up and down the aisle. And she gets to me, and my page is torn from my book. And she skips over me. And she goes to the next child. That might not seem like a big deal, but if you're a first grader and you've been waiting for weeks and weeks to be able to read out loud, it was a big deal. That is so etched on my soul that day. I even remember what I had on, a little brown dress and sweater. And so after class, I run up to Miss O'Neill's desk and the kids are being lined up to, to go 
um, outside to be excused from school. And I say, Miss O'Neill, Miss O'Neill, I need a new book, please. I was very polite about it. And she looked at me and she said, Glenda, nobody has a new book. Well, I want my issue. You know, I mean, now I'd be lobbying for all of us to get books, but I just needed a book. I wasn't putting that dirty, nasty book in my book bag. And as I look back on that with adult eyes, I now, as an adult, understand how difficult that moment was for Mrs. O'Neill. And she looked at me and she said, Glenda, colored children don't get new books. And I don't tell this story to invoke any pain of a past day, but this is an important life story that I want to leave with you. So I didn't understand that. And so I ran home. My dad worked at night and cared for me so he could care for me and my little brother who was only one at the time. And, and I ran home and, and I ran to my dad who was and is and will be throughout all of eternity my hero. Because I figured at, when I was sick, my daddy could fix anything. I didn't have to sit here and talk to this woman. I just go home and tell my daddy. <laughs> I went home fast as I could. Now, for those of you who are looking at me like, what is she talking about? Historical footnote I was in first grade after the Supreme Court decision in Brown. But somehow that, that decision hadn't made its way down to my elementary school in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, if there are any women who grew up in the Deep South who are as old as I am, you know this story. The books were trash. They had been, been taken out as trash the year, school year in and left on the loading dock. And it was the custom that the colored janitors from the colored schools would come and get these books and supplies and then the teachers would piece them together as best they could. That's why my chair didn't fit. That's why the crayons, crayons were nubs. That's why we didn't have playground. Everything was discarded, and then it was sent to the colored schools. And so pages were marred and missing, and, and it was just the best that could be put together for us. So I run home, and I tell my daddy, 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 you got to go up to see Miss O'Neill before she leaves. Daddy, she won't give me a new book. Daddy, she says, colored children don't get new books. And then he said this to me, and this is what I want to leave with you today. He said, Glenda, you go into your room and you get your crayons out. And I had a little red table with two red chairs. He said, I want you to sit down at your table and I want you to write your own story. I didn't get it at six. Oh, but baby, I got it now because he and his wisdom understood that he couldn't fix a society where little colored children didn't get new books, but he could fix me, and so he told me to write my own story. And so my sisters, <laughs> that's what I've come to leave with you. That's my gift to you today is my daddy's lesson that when you get to torn pages in life's book, there are going to be some torn pages. Things that aren't fair, things that are because of torn, because of sexism and racism and all the isms that seem to divide us as a people. But when you get to those pages in life's book that are torn, you can't stop. You can't give up. You got to dare to dig in. You got to write your own story of hope and possibilities because that's what happens. And so when they tell you that you can't because you're a woman, they tell you you can't because you're a minority, they tell you you can't because you grew up in a certain part of this country or you didn't grow up in this country. When they tell you you can't because you are this, that, and the other, you tell them that's the own story. <laughs>